Okay, in this video, we're going to talk about degrees of freedom. And what do we mean by degrees of freedom? Let's start with the definition. Okay, degrees of freedom simply means the number of observations in a sample that are free to vary. Now, when is it necessary to compute degrees of freedom? Well, we assume that information is independent in our sample. And by that, what we mean is that we cannot deduce the value of one observation from any of the other observations or pieces of information that are contained in the sample. Okay, so when we say degrees of freedom, we're really talking about the number of pieces of information that are free of each other. The value cannot be deduced from the other pieces of information. Now, why do we use degrees of freedom? Well, there's an important assumption that we make in uh, statistics, and that is that we assume observations in a sample are randomly drawn from the population. In other words, we do not know the value of any given observation in advance of the analysis. However, once we've collected our data, we in fact have a lot of pieces of information, right? We have all the, all the observations. We also know the sum of the scores and therefore the mean of the data set. Now, let me give you an example as to how this works. Imagine the following data set, it's n equals five, very small data set in which the playing card I'm gonna show you represents a score that is hidden from us. So we'll call that X. Right, so I show you uh, the data here, and then there's another value that's on the other side of the playing card, and I'd say, okay, what is the value on the other side of the playing card? The value of X. Well, there's no way really for you to know, right? Because you don't, it could be anything. There's no way to deduce what that value is. Could be a five, could be a seven, could be 100. Now, however, because we have collected all the data, we also know the total score and therefore the mean because we can divide the total score by n. And let's just imagine that uh, the total score, the sum, is 20. And that includes the value on the other side of that card, right? Now the question is, can we deduce the value on the other side of the playing card? Well, sure, that's not gonna be too hard, right? Because if I add together the values that we clearly observe up here, 5 plus 3, 3 plus 4 plus 2, I get 8 plus 4 is 12, plus 2 is 14, and I just subtract that from 20, that's going to tell, tell me the value on the other side of the card, x equals 6. Now, which value in our data set, in our sample, uh, that is free to vary is really pretty arbitrary. So in the example I just gave you, right, x equals six because I put the card over the value of six. But I could have just as easily put the card over the two, in which case x would have equaled two, or I could have put the, the card over the value of five, in which case x equals five. Notice that in all these cases, the sum remains the same. And uh, so it's really pretty arbitrary where the unknown value is. What we do know, though, is, um, that the number of arbitrary values, or the number of values that are free to vary, that can take on any value, is going to equal the size of the sample minus one. So in this case, the numbers in green, those observations, could really take on any value, so long as the total sum equals 20, right? In which case, I'd say there are really four observations in the sample that are free to vary. So it has four degrees of freedom. You know, when we talk about degrees of freedom, we don't care about what the actual value is. We just care about any of these observations could take on any value so long as the sum equals 20. That's four degrees of freedom, meaning that those pieces of information are pretty independent of all the other information we know about the sample. All right. So the computation of degrees of freedom is pretty straightforward. It's, as a general rule, it's going to be the size of our sample minus one observation, but it's not really that simple. And the reason is because how many samples we have depends on the kind of statistical test we are running. For example, uh, as we move through our understanding of statistics, in a single sample t-test, we will only have one sample of observed values, so n minus one makes sense. But as we move to an independent groups t-test, where we're comparing the means of two groups to one another, there are actually two samples included in the analysis. And as a result, n minus one is not gonna be appropriate because we now have two samples, and each of those samples will have an associated degree of, degrees of freedom. 
And as a result, we have to modify the formula so that we're essentially adding together the degrees of freedom for each of the two samples. Okay, that would be n minus 1 plus n minus 1, which equals n minus 2. But we don't need to worry too much about that right now. That's coming down the road. Now, you may have looked at this and you may have said, hey, you know, this looks a whole lot like Bezel's correction. Um, well, it's a little bit different. Let me tell you why. Well, when do we use Bezel's correction? We use Bezel's correction anytime when the sample variance is used to estimate the population variance. Okay, so it's very specific to variance estimates. Degrees of freedom, on the other hand, we use anytime when we're using sample statistics to estimate population parameters. So both involve using a sample uh, to estimate something about the population. So that's where they're kind of similar. Now, they're different in a lot of other ways, right? So how do we calculate Bezel's correction? Well, uh, it's the sum of squares over n minus 1, the size of our sample minus 1. And then we use s with the caret on top to show that we're estimating the population uh, parameter, right? And, and s squared is the variance, so the population variance from the sample variance. Now with degrees of freedom, what we're doing is we're subtracting one degree of freedom from n for each sample in the analysis, okay? So that's a little bit different, right? That's a, that's a different type, type of computation. Now what's the effect? The effect of Bezel's correction is to correct for a biased estimate of the population variance from the sample variance. That's a little different from degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom, the purpose of doing that is simply to identify the number of observations in the sample that are in fact free to vary, okay? So Bezel's correction gives us a more accurate estimate of the population variance, but degrees of freedom satisfies the parametric assumption of independence of observations. So at a superficial level, they share some similarities, but their function in statistics is really quite different, and it's important that you know the difference between the two.